Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. I'm Don Mazzella. My co-host, Dan Perkins, is on assignment. But we have one of the more extraordinary women with us today. She's Judy Robinette. Uh, she's seen all over the place, USA Today, CBS, etc. We're happy to have her here. Uh, Judy, welcome to the program. Thank you, Don. I'm excited to be here. Well, first off, uh, you've had an extraordinary career, but can you summarize it a little bit for our audience? Sure. So uh, I started life as a social worker, decided that wasn't going to work very well, went into business, uh, worked for a couple of Fortune uh, 100 companies, and then got the wild idea to start my own company. Um, almost went bankrupt, uh, was able to turn it around and sell it, and I became um, uh, uh, very enamored with the startup world, became CEO of a public company for about 10 years, and then I was asked to vet this unknown startup called Skull Candy. Uh, they were broke, um, they had a quarter of a million in sales, had products stuck, uh, stuck in China, and I offered to help them, and they went public two years ago, so... Uh, I became really immersed in the, the startup world. I sit on VC boards and have been having the time of my life and have a new book coming out January 29th called Crack the Funding Code. Okay. So say that slowly, sl- slowly again for our audience, the name of the book. Okay. Crack the Funding Code, How Investors Think and What They Need to Hear to Fund Your Startup. Well, I really want to talk about that as well because uh, uh, in our, all of our surveys, after healthcare, uh, finding financing is the number two uh, thing vexing small business people uh, in yeah. our in our surveys. So yeah, um, it, that's true. Well, I started out with women because um, uh, a lot of your work has has been uh, helping women understand that uh, they, they are more powerful than they sometimes believe. But uh, uh, you're with NABO, et cetera. But um, uh, let's stick on that topic, okay? Okay. Um, oh, number one, my first question, by the way, is what made you decide to write that book? Um, uh, so my first book, How to Be a Power Connector, uh, really was, uh, much like you, you said, Don, uh, I was frustrated uh, myself when I was in a Fortune 100 company looking around and, you know, the guys were always getting promoted and they they were golfing on Fridays. And, and, you know, I'd been taught much like research shows, lower to middle class folks, keep your head down, get the degree, work hard and don't ask for help. Uh, and I quickly determined in any organizational structure, there was this power grid of network of influential people um, and, and I learned that very, very well. And so I've sought uh, for the past 25 years to, to help everyone, not just women and minorities, but certainly uh, women have a little uh, more difficult time with that and, and also with asking. Uh, and so that's where, where that came from. And, and I just I love to help people. Um, and I want people to understand, you know, there's no lack of resources on the world to get anything you need. There's 269 trillion of private wealth in the world. You know, information doubling every few months, they say now, countless ideas. Uh, And a lot of people just need to know, you know, Einstein said, if you're going to play the game, you'd better know the rules. And and I determined I would find the best research out there and then a very practical how-to method to help people uh, become strategic networkers and understand kind of how power in corporations and out in the real world work. 
Well, I was reading your book last night. I wasn't so much reading it as perusing it, and uh, uh, I have my own thoughts, but uh, can you, uh, in a brief time, summarize the two or three um, major thrusts that you think are, are important people should get get out of the book? Yeah, so, you know, number one, it doesn't take a ton of people. Dunford's Law says that groups fall apart on average at about 150 people. Um, and, you know, I've had people say to me they've collected 10,000 email addresses and going to send out holiday cards. And I ask them, how many of those people have ever really helped you? And, and it's usually less than 12. Um, and if you, if you get beyond your friends and family, which is about 15, 5 to 15 people, out to that next level that are known as weak links because they, they don't know everybody that you know, that's kind of where the magic happens. So it's really a build a quality network of 25 people that's pretty diverse um, and, you know, be, be clear on, on your, your goal. You know, decide who it is you need to meet and then figure out how you're going to meet them. And most networking groups, frankly, are are a waste of time. I find many people are in the wrong room because they haven't thought through of what resources that they need. Do you need funding for your company? Do you need, you know, whatever it is you need? And then you make sure that you're in the right room and that you have the right story. So, and, and one of the mistakes I see people make is they don't use the network they've got. And just a quick story my my agent called me after I did the book and said, I want you to meet Mike Muni. He sold Axe Software for $35 million. Uh, I think maybe the two of you should get together and talk. And, and I met with him and I said, Mike, uh, you've got this new software out. I haven't heard anything about it. What are you doing for marketing? And he was really quiet. And, and he said, you know, Judy, if I could just figure out how to get in Success Magazine, that's my target market. And I just smiled And I said, when you go home to Texas, I want you to call my agent, who I've known for a few months, who you've known for years, ask her to introduce you to one of her close friends, Darren Hardy, who was the publisher of the time of Success Magazine. And he almost fell out of his chair. So we don't use the network that we already have. That's also a problem. And most people's network are uh, people that have no influence, no authority. And so, you know, you want to make sure that you have people in your network that can help you and particularly people that will have your back and have your future. And, you know, there is that dark triad of the narcissistic, sociopath, Machiavellian people. You don't need them. That's only 5% of the population. Uh, you just say next. But you want people who, you can, who know you, like you, and trust you, and you feel the same way about them. We're talking with Judy Robinette. Um, she has a new book out. Judy, the title of the book. Crack the Funding Code, How Investors Think, and What They Need to Hear to Fund Your Startup. Uh, do you have a website for the book? Uh, I do. My website's just Judy uh, Robinette, and uh, same thing for LinkedIn or Twitter or my email. Uh, would you mind spe- spelling it out? For instance, I spell it wrong. I add an E at the end. Spell it out for oh, okay. our radio audience. Yeah, it's audience. just W www.judyrobinett uh, dot com. Thank you. Well, you know, um, listening to you, to me, the other thing is the story. I think yeah. a lot of people uh, don't tell their story uh, very well of their product. You want to address exactly. that a little bit? Yeah, and, and so, you know, I I sit on venture capital boards. I've been involved in the startup community for about 25 years. And, and this is, uh, you know, one of the mistakes people make. And, and particularly when you're pitching investors, investors are, are really more interested in the core business. They, they want to know how they're going to get their money back and how soon. And a lot of people focus too much on their product, how, you know, wonderful their Kool-Aid is. Uh, and it, it's important to have a very clear and concise uh, pitch deck that has your management team, uh, you know, what the size of the market is, uh, certainly the competition, uh, but, but, and the numbers. You know, it's critical to know your numbers, um, and everybody will tell you that. Uh, but, you know, your story is absolutely crucial. And, and I see a lot of just wonderful business owners 
um, who really don't have the right story. So whether they're going to uh, a bank or they're looking for investment or debt, uh, it's really important to have a, a good story. And, and I'm happy. I mean, it's in, in my book how to do that, but I'm also happy to uh, people can email me and my email is Judy at Judy Robinette.com. Mm, that, that's good to know. Do you hear that in the audience? Judy, say it again, because you, know, you Ju- may or may okay. not be inundated with people. Yep. Uh, Judy, J U D Y at Judy Robinette, R O B I N E T T dot com. And, and I'm very gracious with, with my time. Uh, I have really good resources, and I'm at the age of my life that uh, I want to make the world a better place, and that's what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs are here to change the world, and that's really why I wrote the book, to have help kind of get the wind under people's wings so they have the, the facts, they know who the investors are, how to get in the door, how to get the right story. At the risk of sounding too much women, I'm just going to throw one at you because uh, it happened – I went to a a venture pitch um, two weeks ago, and there were 14 um, uh, pitches uh, of uh, 14 teams, and there was only one woman on the entire group. Uh, And that didn't surprise me, but when I pointed out to the uh, uh, sponsors of the program, they looked at me as if I uh, was talking Swahili. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, uh, I was really surprised. I didn't come there with that yeah. thought. Uh, I happen to be married to a Harvard MBA, so. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. And, and, um, and this is something women have have struggled with. You know, not only breaking the glass ceiling in the corporate world or getting CEO jobs, but uh, you know, the research shows that the majority of the venture capital out there goes to men. But, you know, thankfully, that is changing. Uh, there's a wonderful accelerator that I'm an advisor to called Springboard. And to date, we've helped female founders raise $8 billion. There's been 14 IPOs. Uh, I think now close to 160 strategic cells. Uh, there's Golden Seed which is an angel group, the third largest in the United States with nearly 300 women and some men who are all accredited investors. They have uh, offices in Boston, New York, uh, San Francisco, and and they also fund companies that are founded by women. And what we're seeing now is many of these women are having exits and they now are investing in other women. So things are getting better, but, but you're right. Uh, it's it's pretty sad. I thought when I was young, you know, we wouldn't have this problem by the time I got, you know, I'm 65. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you're right. <laughs> but it is getting better, Don. <laughs> well, that's the case. But, you know, I've been covering this story um, now since 1964. I wrote my first story about uh, w- women and business in 1964, yeah. as it was brought up yeah. to me the other day. But any, but let's go on to the positive side. And and by the way, there, there are positives. Um, uh, in, in in your book, you talk about these, and and you you uh, mentioned one or two. And let's talk about numbers. Uh, I remember when I was searching for money, uh, I was told uh, whatever the numbers, whatever number you say, your investor, uh, potential investor is going to cut it in half. What do you say to that? Yeah, that's that's not really true, and unless you're wild and, and you're kind of an amateur and don't know how much money to ask for. So, uh, you know, the the typical early stage, the the angel investors um, often will look at putting from a quarter of a million or a half a million in the company, uh, and they don't they don't want to put in lots of money. Usually, if you're early. Uh, you have to have proof of concept. Uh, but if you're realistic, I mean, if you really understand how much money you need and you understand how much angels invest, or family offices, Don, 80% now of family offices, of, you know, wealthy people, folks that manage their money for them, are now investing in startups. And so if you go with the facts and you understand the facts, 
uh, then, you know, they're, they're not, I mean, any investor that would just cut your number in, in half, I, I would tell you to get away that they don't know what they're doing, honestly. Well, that's true. But now, but what's the success rate? I mean, uh, you know, the normal one is uh, only one out of every five companies survive past uh, the fifth year. But uh, in, in startups, what do you think the uh, success rate is? You know, I think it's higher than reported. Um, if you dig into the, the numbers, Don, you find out that a lot of this comes from statistics from the Small Business Administration or some other place. Uh, the company could change its name, it could sell, it could do any number of things. Uh, and, and I don't really, certainly there is a high level of, of people that fell. Uh, and there's only two reasons. I mean, Paul Graham at Y Combinator says there's only two reasons a startup fell. Number one is lack of a customer. And number two is, is lack of funding. Uh, but I think the numbers are getting better. People are getting educated from watching Shark Tank. Uh, now almost every college, high schools have programs on how to be an entrepreneur, and there's much better information out there. The lean startup business models that that teach you, uh, you know, be, before you get hurt, either you know financially or emotionally. Hmm. But see, I don't believe uh, entrepreneurship can be taught. You either have it or you don't. The willingness to jump off the cliff. Uh, and um, what do you what do you say to that? Yeah, well, there is research that shows that um, you know entrepreneurs tend to be the risk takers, and and that's you know less than ten percent of the population. Uh, but I just saw some research yesterday that that shows it, it can be taught, uh, and I didn't have a chance to read through that, but I'll read through that and I'll send it, and you can post it on your your notes. Uh, okay. It does tend to be people that are risk takers because, you know, many people want security. They just want the day job. But, you know, the one of the big groups that want to do a startup is, you know, all the members of AARP, the 50-plus group. And, and a lot of people are like me. I mean, I started getting nauseous when I would think about going to work on Monday morning, and I, I just couldn't do it. I had to figure out a way to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, that, that's true. I always say an entrepreneur is someone who jumps off a cliff and hopes somebody builds a swimming pool before they land. Uh, yeah. But, but that's uh, that's me. I've been in, uh, but, um, you know, but it's interesting. We have what we can now consider the gig economy coming up, which essentially is the idea of having a, a regular job um, uh, or a, a job leading to uh, – uh, long-term security is less important than having freedom. And um, um, that seems to not gel with the idea that people um, want want security and they stay and uh, other people are entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah. Have you thought about that? Yeah. And, you know, what I see, Don, is uh, the, the corporations have broke their promises. I mean, it used to be you could work for a company for 25 years and have a very nice retirement and uh, not worry about your health care, life insurance, dental needs. Uh, and, and we're not seeing that. You know, that that era has gone. And uh, so now I think a lot of the younger generations are saying, hey, you know, dude, you can't trust these big companies you need to be able to take care of yourself. Um, I, and I could go a lot of different ways. Um, you know, you, you've been on both sides of the fence. Which do you prefer, running your own company or running a company f for uh, shareholders? Um, you know, having been a CEO of a small public biotech company, um, I, I really enjoyed it, but it's really a headache and it's costly uh, dealing with the SEC and and all of the filings, the the quarterly Qs and and the Ks, and there's and it's expensive with Sarbanes Oxley. I, I read estimates recently that it's you know six hundred thousand dollars annually by the time you do the audits and all the financials. And so having a, a private company gives you a lot more leeway. Um, and you know now we're having uh, many companies that are delaying going public. Uh, for many more years than, than we used to. But, you know, my own preference is probably 
you know, I, I would like to have matters more so in, in my own hands. Well, you know, uh, when people come, well, we're talking with Judy Robinette. Um, she has a new book out, Judy, uh, title again, and how people can get it. Crack the Funding Code, How Investors Think, and What They Need to Hear to Fund Your Startup. It's available now on Amazon for pre-order and will be in bookstores January 29th. That's good to hear. Um, and I could, I could tell you, having gone, I wish I could say I had read it thoroughly, but I didn't. But uh, reading it last night, it's just jam-packed with good ideas and, and good knowledge. But, uh, I'm, but I'm going to ask you, someone comes to you and says, Judy, I've got this company. I think I'm at the point where I need money to expand. What what are the two or three things you tell that person? Um, Well, um, you know, it would depend on uh, who their prior investors or or if they have other people that, you know, have to to give approval. But certainly um, I would – talk to banks, I would leave no stone unturned on. I actually would, would go to family offices, uh, depending on what industry it's in. I would also go to, to angels. You can go to your local chamber of commerce. You can go to the entrepreneurial school at the college. And, you know, I always tell people I have a couple of golden questions after you tell them your story and you need more funding. Number one is, what other ideas do you have for me? And number two, who else do you know I should talk to? So, you know, I said earlier, there's $269 trillion of private global wealth. There's no lack of money out there. And, you know, there's some very specific rules, though. So, for instance, angels typically only invest in the state where they're at. And you can find all of these angel groups if you just Google, you know, angel groups in Idaho or wherever. Uh, there's now 300 angel groups equal from north to south, west to east. You don't have to go to New York or Silicon Valley. There's over a thousand accelerators and, and incubators, um, and so if you and and also a program that I love that I taught for was the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program. So if you're a small business owner and you have at least a quarter of a million in sales, and I believe it's three to four employees, you can apply to get into their program, and it is like an MBA on steroids. I've never seen anything like it. The curriculum was developed at Babson. And uh, it is funded by Goldman Sachs. So you literally get in on a scholarship. When you get done, you become an alumni of that group, and it's nationwide. Uh, Warren Buffett is the chair over the entire program. uh, And and it is a phenomenal thing, and it's available in most regions throughout the United States. I think they've just announced they're even going to have a program in New Hampshire. And so I would tell people – uh, that, you know, get into that program and, and they will help you figure out a growth strategy, uh, maybe look at expanding your product line, help you figure out that growth to help you figure out performance. But most important is the people that you'll meet in, in the program and the people that are teaching you. Well, that's another thing. When you, you go to a, a conference or something like that, uh, I, I always say, make sure you get the card of the, the speakers because you never know uh, w- w- when they might be useful to you or you useful to them. Um, exactly. I, I teach a course at Columbia for high school students, and I, um, uh, and I always say to them, take my email and when you're uh, ready to go to college if you need a reference or something or if you want to get into uh, a specific college, call me. So it's amazing how how few really do it, um, and I'm, yeah. I'm always surprised. But uh, that to yeah. me is the thing that always surprises me: how this younger generation doesn't seem to want to want to go out and do the networking that you think is so important. Yeah, well, you know, Jack Welch once said, "Forget an MBA, learn to network." Uh, and Sally Krochak said, you know, it's, it's the unwritten law in the business world. I mean, nothing happens without people. You know, it, the number one way to get a job is through your network. Uh, mm-hmm. It's other people that write checks. It's other people that know about jobs, that know about deals. So nothing happens without people. 
And I think it takes a while to, to learn that one. I mean, I was shy and, and bullied. If someone would have said I would, you know, share the stage with Mark Cuban, I would go to fintech conferences at the White House or write books, I would have told them I was nuts. <laughs> or they were nuts. And um, it's because I've, I've learned how to be generous and, and help. And an example, I helped a lawyer in D.C. and she called me last October and said, Judy, I'd like you to go on a diplomatic mission to Serbia. And my first thought was, Serbia? Why on earth would I want to go to Serbia? And they were working with startups and, and meeting with the government officials to try to uh, grow the, the ecosystem. And I thought, you know, I'll, I'll just go and maybe I'll, you know, I'll try to help as best I can. Well, Kevin Harrington, who's a friend of mine, was the first shark on Shark Tank, uh, said, Judy, I want you to vet this entrepreneur in Belgrade who has a company called Easy Going and tell me about his character. Well, I was so impressed with this guy that I started working with him. Um, and he now has a, a corporation that is established in the United States, in New York, and you know we're in talks with Walmart, uh, many other corporations, and I'm having the time of my life. And so I base a lot of things that have happened to me on being generous, figuring out how to add value, much like you said, you, you never know. I gave a speech at Walmart to 1,650 people, and another woman on the stage, um, her name is Rachel. She would be excellent as a guest. She heads up Intel's global sales and marketing. Um, and we have now become friends. I have referred her to folks. Uh, and, and, and this is, you know, you build the relationship uh, of high-quality people and learn how to add value just be generous and kind. I mean, research shows on likability. Uh, the number one thing is just being authentic. Uh, your mm -hmm. looks count for less than 2%. And, and competency, competency and sense of humor are both 22%. So, uh, you know, people really have to know you, like you, and trust you to do business with you. Mm. Well, yeah, um, Judy, we could go on and on. Uh, I, I see our next guest just uh, dropped off the grid. But uh, anyway, I, uh, your website again and how people can reach you? Uh, my email, Judy at JudyRobinette.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at Judy Robinette. And the same thing, look me up on LinkedIn, and I always get back to people. You can find me easily online. We've been listening to Judy Robinette. Um, a link to her website will be on recalculating.biz tonight, where you can hear this and every other past and future program. And you can tell us who you'd like to hear on this program. Judy, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Don. It was a pleasure. Happy to help. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2hsa.com. That's 2hsa.com. Marcus Limonis, J.D. Powers, and John Scully and a hundred other presidents and experts contributed to recalculating the book. Why did all these people agree to contribute to the book? I'm Don Mazzella, and I'm the editorial director of Small Business Digest. And for 20 years, we have been offering small business leaders information and data to increase profits. Recalculating the book was named the best small business book by the Independent Press Association. Whether you need help with marketing, staffing, finance, operations, technology, or many other subjects, they're all here in recalculating the book. They're now available at Amazon at a reduced cost. We've also created the radio program Recalculating on Recalculating.biz. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures 
that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. This is Don Mazzella. My co-host, Dan Perkins, is on assignment. But we, we have a really great guest with us today, Brett Putter. Uh, Brett, without further ado, I'm going to ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your book, and where people can reach you. Don, really great to be uh, with you today. Thanks very much. Um, so, yes, uh, my company is called Culture Gene, and um, I run a company culture consultancy, mainly working with high-growth early-stage companies, um, helping to prepare them for scale, uh, traditionally venture-backed and um, growing very, very quickly and wanting to get the rest of their growth um, uh, right for the future. Um, I wrote a book and uh, published it a couple of weeks ago called Culture Dex Decoded. Uh, what I've basically done is, is taken all of the great culture decks online. Um, so, for example, you've got Netflix, LinkedIn, Asana, HubSpot, uh, Valve, Patreon. These companies have placed their culture decks uh, online, and um, I decided to choose the best slides from these decks and – turn that into a handbook for people who are looking at understanding how to develop their culture better and essentially write a culture deck. Um, and uh, people can have a look at my website, which is www.culturegene, which is culture, G-E-N-E, and dot A-I. So culturegene.ai. Let, let me ask you this question. You deal with high growth companies. Uh, in your experience, what makes for a high growth company and how can a, a, a business achieve high gro growth? So the, the typical companies that I work with are technology companies and um, what they're normally doing is disrupting an industry or, or, or changing an industry or completely inventing a new industry. Uh, so they're, they're high growth by the nature of the opportunity that's in front of them, and they normally will attract a significant investment in the form of venture or private equity uh, funding. So that's really the, the, the high growth piece comes as a function of the opportunity in, fr in front of them and the way they are disrupting a traditional market. So to give you an example of a company like this, uh, there's a company, uh, they're actually fully remote, called Hotjar, and they sell uh, a software-as-a-service solution which allows people to look at the analytics of users using their website. And this type of product used to be sold for half a million to two or three million dollars, and uh, IBM was one of the major providers of this software. Hotjar sell not exactly the same functionality, but a good enough functionality for 89 euros a month. So they have this huge, small to medium-sized business opportunity who couldn't afford to buy IBM software, but were desperate for something similar. And so they're this kind of company. They've gone from zero to uh, $16 million in annual recurring revenue in under four years, to give you an example. Well, are they mostly uh, centered on technology companies that, uh, in effect, may, uh, make it easier for uh, companies to do uh, do tests? Or can they uh, also be, uh, for instance, someone who brought one up to me, uh, uh, creating an acoustical box so that you can um, uh, put it over uh, your, your uh, Amazon uh, device so it doesn't hear what you're saying. I mean... Uh, so I guess my question is, does it have to be technology-based or can it just be identifying uh, something that needs to be done? 
it definitely it doesn't have to be technology based. It uh, needs to, as you said, identify a job that that has to be done. Uh, the advantage of technology is once it's developed, it um, often has network effects. So you so the cost of distributing it is low, and you don't have to manufacture it. Um, yes. But yeah, there are there are lots of good companies that grow very quickly that are that are um, you know uh, companies that sell. Uh, fashion to companies that that make uh, uh, different products. Well, it's, it's, uh, it seems to me uh, we're going more and more into uh, staying at, at our computer desk and having the world come to us rather than having to go out and do it. So, yeah. If, am I right in that? And uh, is there a dangerous byproduct to that? I do think you're right in that. We're um, we definitely are more uh, desk bound and and focused on our what I call a digital leash, um, which is your, your the mobile phone. Um, and I and I do think there is a danger to it, but it seems that this is the way the world is going, and you know we have to adapt to that. The um, mm. the the reality of of it is you you know you don't interact with as many people. You don't get outside. You you know you you you. I think I think you, you see the rise of social media and the issues that come from social media, where people don't actually know how to have a conversation or an argument in a in a normal way. I think there there are significant dangers to that. Well, I couldn't agree more. But uh, in this this weekend's paper, uh, the New York Times and several other papers were talking about the fact that. Um, um, uh, this being tethered to the uh, to your phone and to uh, the screen has led to uh, serious problems in terms of social interaction. I know this is not your yeah. uh, area, but uh, and we're going to get back to yours. But I'm curious uh, how uh, how you see it, and if you see it as a problem as well. Yeah, I do see it as a problem. I if you follow the I try and avoid social media actually as as much as possible because people people in the good old days if you if you said something to somebody over the telephone or to their face um, and you weren't very nice to them that could have consequences. But today you don't have to you you can you know you can abuse people from a distance over the internet and doesn't have any consequences and that is a that becomes a, a fundamental issue when it comes to, you know, human engagement um, and th- this trolling that we see online. So yeah, I think I'd, I, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of it, but I don't know how it can be stopped. I think that uh, that particular um, horse is bolted. That's for sure. Um, the name of your company, the name of your book, and uh, how people can reach you. Yeah, the, thanks. The company is called Culture Gene. Uh, the book is called Culture Dex Decoded, um, and people can reach me at www.culturegene.ai. Can you spell out that? This is a radio. Sure. That's culture, C-U-L-T-U-R-E-G-E-N-E dot A-I. Okay. Now, let's let's concentrate on your area. It's enough that I've taken you a little further afield, but uh, you have such a great reputation um, as being a, a, a thinker that I, I really wanted to get your, your thoughts on some subjects. Um, and that's why you're on the program. Um, yeah. But uh, tell us a little bit more about your company and tell tell us about a little bit more about your experience with companies and how you can how you can help them and how uh, some of the problems they've encountered being high growth companies. Yeah, so my company helps uh, high growth companies define, embed and reinforce their culture. Uh, and what that means is I work with these companies to understand what their mission, vision and values are and then to embed those into the functions, processes and procedures of the business. The problem that that most that happens with most companies is they define their values and their mission and their vision and they invest the time doing that. They stick them up on the wall and then they tell everybody to live those values. And that's a challenge because 
all values are um, open to interpretation unless you define them. So, for example, if, if you and I, Don, were in a, a business together and we decided that teamwork was our, one of our values, um, your interpretation of teamwork might be a group of people getting together, communicating well with a common, uh, a common goal uh, to be achieved in a certain period of time. But my interpretation of teamwork is the team always comes first. And so we're talking about the same thing, but we're looking at it from a different angle. And that means we may actually make different decisions considering we have the, the same value. So what I do is I help companies really understand what those values mean to the company and what the interpretation is and how people are expected to behave in that company based on those values. And then we embed it deeper into the, the, the function. So we'll sit down with the sales, we'll sit down with marketing, we'll sit down with engineering, and we'll look at how they're being rewarded, what's being measured, how, what are we doing with learning and development in the team, um, uh, where, are we in, where are we investing and investing in allocating funds. And from there, we, we essentially help them build a uh, system around their culture that is reinforceable over time. So people don't just do a little bit of work and say, okay, our culture is done now because culture evolves over time with the business. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. But, but look, I mean, there are companies like Facebook right now that are facing a, a employee revolt because the, um, they, uh, um, the employees seem to think that the, the, um, these companies are, are, are not uh, – doing what the employees think are the company values. Um, do you want to comment on that and how you, you head that off? Yeah, so this is an interesting um, topic for me, which I've been looking at quite a lot recently. Um, the, thing about, the thing about culture is often in a company, it's, um, it's an, 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 there's sort of a, an implicit agreement between the company and the person they employ. And in companies like Facebook, the engineers that they're hiring are very, very well paid and they can go anywhere. So they can go to Google, they can go to Microsoft, they can go to Airbnb, the choice is theirs. So it's really important that Facebook create an environment and a culture that they're happy with. And so when, when companies like fail, Facebook or Salesforce um, or Google create scenarios where they're not living those values or not perceived to be living those values, then, then that you do get uh, your team do revolt and your, two, your team do will, will you know, say, no, we've had enough of this. Um, so when Salesforce was selling to the Department of um, Homeland Security, they had 650 people within their organization sign a petition telling them to stop that. And actually, com and some engineers left the company because, of, because of they were selling to the um, uh, Department of Homeland Security. So it's a very tricky tightrope that these companies are working. It's a, it's a balance between wanting the feedback and, and wanting to keep you know, the, 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 the team communicating. And the balance there is, is also about... Um, ensuring that you know they don't overstep the line because then their employees will move on They're, you know the employees especially in these companies can get up and go anywhere anytime well um, true but see i guess i look at it differently uh, there was a time when a, a company owed allegiance to the government uh, to some to some extent and um, uh, <clears throat> i'm going to turn it around uh, as a mem if I were a member of a board of a company like that, uh, what is my main loyalty? To my stockholders? Uh, to my country? To my employees? I mean, um, it, it seems to me, um, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, an employee could leave the company, but uh, the company, I think, has some sort of loyalty to, to the country uh, to uh, uh uh, help the country enforce its laws. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's um, you know dependent on the individuals and the board. Um, the, um, the, the it, and also dependent on the type of people you employ. So, for example, um, if you work at McDonnell Douglas 
um, or you work at Boeing, you you know the people there know that you're you're going to be dealing with the uh, military, you're going to be de- dealing with the government, um, and some people in at, at Google or Salesforce or Facebook um, don't want to be doing that, and that's really in the you know from an independent point of view, it's an individual's point of view really, um, and it's the board's point of view. I you know the some people say you know we pay our taxes. That's enough. Other people say, you know, we must do more. And and once again, that's, you know, it, it really depends on on where the uh, where the board and where the individuals um, their what where their beliefs are. Well, could we uh, talk a little bit? Fifty nine percent of our audience are presidents and or owners. So let's talk about it, if we may. And, uh, and if you uh, w- would like to continue down this road, if not, we can go back a different way, because this is an issue that's really starting to uh, percolate throughout the uh, uh, business and uh, social world today. But it, it seems to me, if I were on the board of a company and uh, my employees would say to me, they don't want to uh, uh, do government contracts, um, I have to make a decision whether, um, as a board member, uh, uh, where do my loyalties lie? The long-term growth of the company, um, uh, our role in, in society as, as, as good government, or to our employees? Uh, am I being too uh, high-handed, or uh, what do you think? Now, I, I think... I think CEOs of, or, or leaders of companies are in a difficult situation because um, the market is, is very competitive for great talent, whether you're in a small to medium-sized business in engineering or if you're a, you're a big software business. Um, and so if, you, if, if, if your approach is going to be, um, you know, we are going to work in this sector – uh, then I think you need to hire people and recruit people who are happy to work in that sector. Um, that'll eliminate any of the, 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 the you know, if, if, if you recruit people who are really happy to, you know, support um, the military in their endeavors, then that's great. If you, if you don't, then it's about the values that you bring to the table and the values your company brings to the table and, the overlap with the people who you employ. And if you don't understand what the values of your people are, then you could come up with, with certain issues around that. So, so for me, I don't, I don't look at it from a moral perspective as much as I look at it from a what's the workaround or what's the right way to approach it so that moral obligation doesn't come into, into calling. Um, so if I was, if I was running a, a business now and, and, you know, it was, there was a possibility that we would one of the one of the verticals we would target would be the military. Then, you know, I would, as part of the interview process, I would be talking to people and say, oh, you know, are you comfortable with this or not? Because if you're not, then we don't want you in the company. Well, um, we're talking with Brett Brett Putter. Brett, the name of your book and your company again for our audience. Yeah, that, the name of the book is Culture Dex Decoded, and the uh, company name is Culture Gene. That's spelled C U L T U R E G E N E. Dot A I is the uh, URL. Well, uh, we're talking about a subject that's rapidly becoming uh, and expected to be a very uh, important topic in uh, in, um, in 2019. Well, uh, Brett, um, based on your experience, what what would you tell um, uh, business leaders to do in anticipation of, of this problem? Uh, I know you didn't come on to, to talk about it, but uh, it is such an important topic. I'd like you, uh, I'd like your your take on how you would handle it uh, as a president or leader of a company. The problem is that we we increasingly have a sales a an employee force that um, seems to want to dictate what are, quote, good um, uh, uh, customers to have and what are, quote, un- not-so-good customers to have. 
and whether they're government, ice, uh, whether they're uh, companies that make napalm, or what what have you, we seem to be um, uh, moving into a, a period where employees are saying, um, uh, for, for instance, um, uh, in, in Facebook, they're also uh, in Amazon. They're talking about the fact that somebody got paid thirty million dollars, even though he was being uh, let go because of uh, sexual harassment. The employees seem to be saying, "We want a, a hand in what uh, the decision is being made uh, by uh, our senior management." Yeah, I think this is actually a function of um, the new economy and a function of the way businesses are built now. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, when uh, 40 years ago, businesses were built on a need-to-know basis, so information trickled down from the top as it was needed. Um, And so a hierarchical structure with a lot of management made sense. Today, the pretty much all the information we need is on the internet. So um, a lot of the information is available to people now. And so, you know, people can learn whatever they want to learn on on the web. So we're now getting flat structured businesses that are less hierarchical and, and more people making decisions themselves. And it's also, I think, a function of this millennial generation who have high expectations um, and uh, high demands, not like they used to be when I started working where, you know, I was just happy to get a job um, <laughs> and, and a decent salary. Now they want a job, a decent salary. They want, you know, they have expectations. They want autonomy. They want to make their own decisions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They want to rise up quickly. So I think it's a combination of these things. And so um, I, I, don't, I don't see how... Um, Companies that that are in a situation where they have to attract the best talent um, can avoid this situation. So, the best the best talent is very rare. It's 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 very expensive to acquire, and it's expensive to retain. Um, and at the end of the day, you have a responsibility as a leader to your business and a responsibility to your board um, to make that business a success. Uh, and your shareholders to make it a success. So um, uh, employees now have more say because they've got digital networks, they've got Facebook, they've got other areas where they share, they've got Slack. So it's easy for these employees to mobilize and to, you know, to, to, to say, no, we don't want that. Um, I, it's, I would say it's a, it's a, it's a pretty tough environment to be, to be a leader because the, the, the 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 sort of I think the game and the way the game the game of business is played has changed. The um, power has moved to the talent versus the leadership. So if leadership don't want you know if le- if the leaders don't want to change and don't want to don't want to adapt, then you know then they have to recruit people who fit in with with their policies. Uh, but it's yeah this is a it's a it is a very, very uh, interesting and dynamic challenge for 2019 and beyond. Well, well, but listening to you, it seems your company is uh, amongst the most uniquely equipped to help uh, companies do the uh, uh, weather this change. Am I am I reading too much into it? But from what I can read about you, no. Uh, that's what you, you help people do. Leaders do. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's exactly right. So um, a lot of a lot of uh, leaders don't don't uh, invest the time to really understand how culture impacts their businesses. Um, so if you think about it, company culture is the one sustainable competitive advantage that a CEO has full control over. All the other competitive advantages can be impacted by the competition, and so the smart leaders go out and invest significantly in making sure that their culture is um, uh, visible, tangible, and lived by the organization. And that means that they have this additional lever that they can use to attract talent, 
um, that they can use to ensure that the people who join join with the right values and the right mindset. So if you you know if you're starting a business today and that business is uh, to sell guns to to the police, military, and so on, um, you know you, then you value you, you value um, certain things and you would recruit against those values. If you're selling, you know, if you're starting a, a business today and and you want to uh, eradicate guns from the planet, you will, you know, through software or something, then you will have, those the people who hi- who you hire will have different values to the to the to the the, the people who who um, li- like guns and, and want to sell guns. And what we do is we, we whichever the business is, um, whatever type of business, we just help them define those values and then help them ensure that those values are lived on a constant basis. And um, your website again and your book for, for people, Brett? Yeah, yeah. so the book is Culture Dex Decoded. Um, and what I've done there is taken the best slides from companies like Netflix, like HubSpot, Hootsuite, uh, Sana, and LinkedIn, and just built a framework in the form of a, of a handbook to demonstrate to people how to create their own culture deck and work on their culture and improve their culture. The company is called Culture Gene, and that's C-U-L-T-U-R-E-G-E-N-E dot A-I. Well, Brad, I, I could go on for, uh, I think, for another half hour with you. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Uh, but thank, we've been talking with Brett Putter. Uh, he, he's certainly brought us a lot of things to think about. Uh, a link to his website will be on recalculating.biz tonight, where you can hear this and every other past and future program. Brett, thank you so much for being with us. Really great to share some time with you, and um, I certainly could have continued this conversation if we had the time, Don. Uh, really great. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Um, And please, we want you to come back in the new year and talk some more. You know, Dan, before we go any further, I I want our audience to know about your new runaway hit book on uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease and how it affects teenagers. Please tell us about it. Yeah, Don, thank you. The book is called Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? Uh, It's a book written primarily for, for children ages 9 to 12 but really needs to be read by the entire family. Uh, And what I try to do is I try to take the the subject matter of dementia and the challenges uh, to a a different level in the form of a mystery story with my two little detectives, two little girls, Hudson and Charlotte. And uh, it it really creates a a breakthrough opportunity for small children and parents and families to begin understand the problem with dementia see don the the real challenge is that the children are the forgotten people mom and dad spend so much time working to try and take care of mom and dad they don't take the time to explain to the children what's going on in grandma or grandpa's brain so you can buy it at amazon.com and or you can order it through your local bookstore or any online bookstore besides amazon has it available why can't grammy remember me illustrations are spectacular a story by Dan Perkins. Your runaway bestseller, new book. Why Can't Grammy Remember Me by Dan Perkins. Dan Perkins here for Songs and Stories for Soldiers with your veterans tip of the day. Did you know that the suicide rate for women vets is 12 times that of their sisters in civilian life? Did you know that one in four women vets feel uncomfortable about talking to people about their mental health issues? Did you know almost 600,000 women vets in America are suffering from PTSD? It's time to help. It's time for all of us to encourage our sisters, mothers, and wives to get help by contacting their local VA hospital clinic or community-based health care center. So if you know a woman vet that is suffering, go to va.gov and find their nearest VA facility. This has been Dan Perkins of Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us with your veterans tip of the day. 
Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful 